Hello, everyone. It is the evening of, well, April the 1st. And unfortunately, these two are still our, our presidential candidates. That is not an April 1st joke. So sorry, I can't do anything about the political climate, but I can find some interesting stories that we can look at while we commiserate with each other. Welcome, Cynthia and Ghostery and Melanie and Wolfram. Thanks for doing the modly stuff. And Flash Fan, I hope you are doing well. I'm doing great. I found this. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to. Wonderful shadow box daily. So that when I fill up a one of my cork boards until I get a giant cork board, I can put all of the little tags in there and it lights up. Well, sort of. <laughs> Look, it was from Amazon and, you know, straight from, I'm sure, very depths of China. So <laughs> it's probably not the greatest, but we all have our own things. So I'm super excited about that because until I get into my real office office, I only have small boards so I can keep all those together and not have my feral children, you know, destroy things in theory. It's all in theory. Uh, our first story tonight. Oh, I'm glad you made a live. I have questions about everything. And I'm sorry, I could not get the link to save my life. But that is the desk that I got. And I'm very proud of me. I stood up for most of the day and my legs are like, you have not done this in a while. And I'm like, I need to work on this. Yes, I do. <laughs> so our first story, we are quite confused about um, what is going on. There's not a whole lot of information, but apparently a driver has rammed into the front gate of the Atlanta FBI office and has been taken into custody. Now, I don't know if he was having a case of the Mondays, if he didn't get his TPS reports filed in just correctly, but they do have stop gaps in order to, you know, make sure this doesn't happen. This little, you know, destructo car thingy here, just if anyone has in mind that, that they're going to pay a surprise visit to the FBI, no, you're not. Okay. <laughs> It's not going to happen. A driver rammed into the front gate of Atlanta FBI office Monday afternoon and was taken into custody, according to FBI officials. The car appeared to try to follow an unauthorized vehicle or an authorized vehicle as it was entering the gate. And the pop up barrier was deployed to stop the unauthorized car, officials said. He was like, no, I'm with them. They have Jimmy John's and I have the dipping sauce. <laughs> no. Uh, today, a person rammed into FBI Atlanta's front gate shortly after noon, the Bureau said in a statement Monday, adding, he was not associated with this facility. Several of our special agents who were passing by apprehended the man after he exited his vehicle. FBI Atlanta continued, Currently, we are looking into both state and federal charges. Well, sir, you totaled your car, and you're going to get all the charges. Like, all of them, sir. No injuries were reported, FBI officials said. The man's motives are not known, and he's being evaluated at a local, hospitals, or a local hospital. FBI agent... And bomb technicians check the vehicle in a standard operating procedure, and the investigation is ongoing, officials said. The office is outside of Atlanta in Chambly, Georgia. So there you go. <laughs> he figured, yeah, you know, we it's April Fool's Day. I figured I'd try to goof on the FBI. Oh my gosh, you guys, if it was an April Fool's joke... I mean, apart from it being terribly misguided and probably going to catch you a bunch of felonies, if that happens to be the case, I will laugh my ever-living boobs off. I doubt that is the case, but if it is, I will officially be flat-chested. It, it would be a miracle. <laughs> Good lord. 
uh, in, he might quickly become, be becoming my favorite person in Hollywood. Larry David tells CNN's and formerly Fox News's Chris Wallace, it's none of your effing business when asked about his net worth. Now, the other thing that Larry David has done lately that has made me love him even more is when he, I guess, you know, kind of play acted beat up Elmo on live television. <laughs> and I guess uh, just traumatized Wesley from freaking Star Trek generation so badly that he did like a five page dissertation on on Twitter amazing larry larry david takes no f's and gives no s's and then people are shocked when things like this comes out of his mouth but if there was ever a reporter i'd want to tell them it's none of your effing business it would be chris wallace Larry David told Chris Wallace to curb his enthusiasm over asking about the comedian's net worth and made a crass reference to the late Barbara Walters' sex life during the contentious interview. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to go I'm going to have to go watch this interview and usually I won't watch anything from CNN. Welcome Alice G. I am doing fine. I hope you had a wonderful Monday. Oh, Chambly. You know, if they just named everything Smithville, my life would be a lot easier. I mean, we'd all be confused, but my life would be easier. <laughs> the curmudgeonly comic who stars in the HBO hit show Curb Your Enthusiasm and was the co-creator of a classic sitcom Seinfeld did not appreciate the line of questioning by CNN host during their sit down for a recent episode of Who's Talking to Chris Wallace, which streams on Max. Quote, none of your effing business, David replied during a testy exchange in which he also told Wallace to shut up. I mean, I'm not finding anything upsetting yet. <laughs> When he pressed him for an answer, according to a transcript of the interview that was reported by uh, Meditate or Meditate, or is it Mediaite? Mediaite, never mind. It's them phonics. They just got me. <laughs> Wallace told Davis that he read on the internet that the Seinfeld coal creator's fortune was around half a billion dollars, a figure that didn't sound too far fetched, considering a recent report that put his pal Jerry Seinfeld's net worth at one billion. That number is so preposterous, okay, David replied. Ridiculous. Okay, how about 100 million? Wallace then asked, prompting David to reply, Okay, how about you just shut up? Okay, how about you shut up? Is that all right? <laughs> oh, you know, as a curmudgeon myself, I'm, I'm loving this. Wallace told David that in scores of interviews he's done for television, quote, nobody's ever said that to me. Well, just shut up, David replied. Wallace awkwardly steered the conversation back to David's comedy career, though later in the interview, the host admitted he was trying to get over the shut up because it stings. Oh my gosh, Chris Wallace, I'm gonna need you to, to man up just a little bit. I'd say it's a little hurtful, Wallace told David. The Curb Your Enthusiasm star replied, hurtful? What about your question? What kind of question is that? <laughs> Welcome right back from Midwestern Indiana, where I'm just trying to avoid, well, thunderstorms for now. <laughs> It's perfectly legitimate, Wallace told David. He invoked Walters, quoting her as once saying that there's no such thing as an indiscreet question. There's only indiscreet answers. David said he didn't think that statement was true, adding, I wonder how Barbara Walters would react if someone had asked her, hey, Barbara, how many times a week do you have 
the smexy times with your husband, do you um, give him mouth hugs? I mean, true that. I think I think she might be a little pissed off if someone asked her indelicate questions. Do you think she would like that? David asked Wallace. <laughs> Wallace replied that she probably would say none of your business, but that I don't think she would have said shut up. The post has sought comment from Wallace, but he's too busy crying in his hanky. Uh, David and Walter's family. Walters, the first female television news anchor in the U.S., died December 2022. She was 93. Last week, Bloomberg's Billionaire Index valued Seinfeld's wealth for the first time as the stand-up comedian's net worth reportedly cracked the 10-digit mark. Interesting. In 2015, Forbes reported that David had a net worth in the hundreds of millions of dollars before David divorced his then-wife. Now that's how you lost it. <laughs> Lori Leonard in 2007, some reports estimated his wealth as high as 900 million. So there you go. Yeah, it's really, he kind of signaled that he didn't want to answer the question, Chris Wallace. He told you, um, how about let's not answer? You continued on. So when he said off you F, you got a little testy because he told you to shut up for cereals. <sighs> weird, just weird. In some good news, a Missouri teen. So this is the girl that was in that viral video uh, is out of the ICU, but has limited speech and trouble walking on her own, attorney says. A Missouri teenager who was beaten in what officials called a deranged display of violence by another teen is out of the intensive care unit, but has limited speech and trouble walking on her own, an attorney for the family said. Kaylee Gain was hospitalized since a March 8th fight near Hazelwood East High School in St. Louis County that was captured in a viral social media video. The footage shows several people fighting in the street near an intersection of Norgate and Claudine Drives, the St. Louis County Police Department said in a March 11th Facebook post. One person is seen repeatedly punching Gain and slamming her head into the ground. A 15-year-old girl was arrested on assault charges a day after the fight, authorities said. Police said that the victim was found, quote, suffering a severe head injury, end quote, and was taken to the hospital in critical condition. In an update Friday, an attorney for Gaines' family said that she was out of the intensive care unit and, quote, has been able to engage in limited verbal conversations. Kaylee has also recently begun speech therapy and has gone on a few short walks with the assistance of hospital staff as she is still unable to ambulate on her own. Attorney Brian uh, Kamer, Kamer -er -er, said, however, Kaylee does not have any recollection of the altercation that led her to hospitalization. Uh, the attorney addressed several social media rumors about the altercation, denying reports that Gaines' mother drove her to the location of the fight. He said Gaines' mother was at work and had driven to the hospital, was driven to the hospital by a coworker after police informed her of what happened. The attorney, however, did confirm reports that Gaines had been involved in a, on a in a fight on March 7th with a different teenager. Both girls were suspended after that incident. He said it was unclear whether the March 8th brawl was in retaliation. Gaines' parents are calling for the 15-year-old to be tried as an adult. The family's attorney said in his statement that the family believes trying the accused as, the, as an adult is the most appropriate way to provide justice uh, that Kaylee deserves. Authorities have not said if the 15-year-old will be tried as an adult. St. Louis County Prosecuting Attorney Wesley Bell said in a post on X that the fight was sickening and the video was difficult to watch. Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey called the actions in the video a deranged display of violence that must be punished 
to the fullest extent of the law. On Thursday, police announced that eight more teenagers were referred to the St. Louis County Family Court for consideration of assault charges. NBC affiliate uh, KSDK of St. Louis reported. They include a 17-year-old girl, a 17-year-old boy, two 16-year-old girls, three 16-year-old boys, and one 14-year-old girl. None of the other teens have been taken into custody. So it is really good that she is, um, get, she came out of the coma and the problem is, is that she is going to have so much to relearn. It sounds like there were a lot of things that, um, you know, were affected by the trauma in her brain. Serious brain injuries are nothing to play with. So she is going to have so much rehabilitation to um, have to go through that I think that, I mean, unfortunately, when you're a teen, you can still make really dumb adult choices. And this, I think, rises to the level of an adult choice. I don't know, but that's how I feel about it. Uh, we knew that happiness was too good to last. <laughs> In the strangest story that I've reported on yet, conjoined twin Abby Hensel's husband it has been hit with a paternity suit two years after they were married. I still have so many questions. The Army veteran husband of conjoined twin Abby Hensel has been hit with a paternity suit filed by another woman since they married. Yikes. The Post has learned the bombshell lawsuit was filed on October 2023, almost two years after the after medic Joshua Bowling, 34, and Hensel, who documented her life sharing a body with her sister Brittany Hensel in a TLC reality series, secretly wed in November 2021. The paternity case was filed by Bowling's ex-wife, Annika Bowling, 33, against Joshua and another respondent. You better hope it's not you. You got two choices. It's a 50-50 shot, sir. Let's hope the Maury, you know, I, you know, we were trying to figure that out. I don't think it's it's um, bigamy, but I'm not sure. We were all trying. The, the thing I wondered about was custody, because if if a child is born from the twins, then could feasibly one of the twins who is not married to him also sue for custody? I don't know. It's all 12 shades of I need to know everything and asking all the ridiculous questions. The court record. Oh, so there was another respondent, too. So Gavin Vatnestel in Minnesota court. The court records show a genetic test report was entered into the file just weeks ago on March 7th, 2024. But the, the details and the results are not publicly available. Annika and Josh, who married in 2010, have one daughter together, eight-year-old Isabella, who they share joint custody of, according to court documents obtained by the Post. Those documents state she is their only joint child born during the marriage. The couple split in April 2019, and Annika had another daughter, who was born late 2020 and is now three. It appears possible that the child whose paternity is now being contested, uh, but available court documents do not make clear that she is a minor. Interesting. Uh, Neither Annika Joshua Joshua Vatninstall or the Hensel twins responded to the post's request for comment. In Annika and Joshua's uh, 2022 divorce papers, the younger daughter referred to as Isabella's half-sister, or is referred to as Isabella's half-sister. Joshua and the conjoined twins have a close relationship with Isabella, who was a guest at the wedding and appears in many of photos 
on social media with both sides of her family. Several pictures show Abby, now her stepmother, and Brittany laughing at the little girl and hugging her. Following the revelations of the secret marriage last week, Abby and Brittany wrote Friday on TikTok, the internet is extra loud today, alongside a clip featuring photos of them as the song Real Love Baby by Father John Misty played. I don't understand TikTok. Uh, we've always been around, hashtag, so apparently they're still madly in love. In a second video titled Hashtag Forever, the pair could see could be seen embracing bowling in a photo as a voiceover said, this is for all you haters out there. If you don't like what I do, but watch everything I'm doing, you're still a fan. This story is, is a crazy ball of yarn. Like what in the actual schnell? Just absolutely cray cray. And we're not haters, we just have all the questions that aren't appropriate to ask. Uh, let's see. So, it's, I mean, we've been through this. Apparently, it seems like he's probably not the father, given the way they worded the, uh, you know, divorce papers. But I'm guessing other dad possibility behind door number two is contesting that he is daddy-o for reals. So they're having to do all of the DNA testing. I have no idea, y'all. I'm all the confused just like you are. <laughs> Chad Daybell's getting ready to unleash his loin fire. I mean, his defense. I mean, God, I hope it's not the same thing. Idaho man Chad Daybell to be tried for three deaths, including children who were called quote-unquote zombies. Now, I may have to read his terrible, terrible book, but I don't have, I don't know if I am into being that mean to myself. <laughs> uh, well... Justin Smith, someone did try to go into the Atlanta FBI when they were not invited. I don't know if they thought it was an April Fool's Day joke or what. But they are on, so Chad Daybell's case right now is in jury selection. Um, they did, They, I believe they did um, plan at least two weeks for jury selection because they all had all the jury prospects had to fill out a big old questionnaire right now, or at least for the last couple days. And yes, he gives everyone all the icks, except for Lori, who apparently got all the, mm-hmm. Because she was a little weird. The trial of a man charged in the deaths of his wife and girlfriend's two youngest children is set to begin in Idaho this week, serving as a second act in the bizarre case that has drawn nationwide and worldwide attention and has already resulted in a life sentence for the mother of the children. Chad Daybell's trial is expected to last up to 10 weeks. Holy God. And welcome, Ghost Fox. There is no way. <laughs> With jury selection scheduled to get underway in Boise on Monday, the 55-year-old self-published author is charged with three counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Tammy Daybell, seven-year-old Joshua J.J. Vallow, and J.J.'s big sister, Tylee Ryan, who was last seen a few days before her 17th birthday. The younger children's mother, Lori Vallow Daybell, who married Chad Daybell shortly after the deaths, was found guilty last year and sentenced to life in prison without parole. The couple claimed they could tell if people had been possessed by dark spirits that could turn them into quote-unquote zombies. Former friend Melanie Gibb testified in court. They believed the only way to get rid of the zombie was to destroy the possessed person's body by killing them. Good Lord. Good Lord. Just all the icks. All the icks. And, and she, 
Lori, flash forward and spoiler alert, is going or is down in Arizona right now to get ready to be charged for her uh, fourth fourth husband's unaliving Charles or Charles Vallow. And she still looks like just skipping into court, like, no, la di da, it's a Thursday. I mean, Chick is out to lunch. And honest to goodness, I hope she is out to lunch. Because if she was dead to right sane when she did this to her kids, all the Snake Island. But Honestly, after reading Chad Daybell's Mormon romance, you both need to be thrown directly into the sun for having put that into my brain, okay? The children's bodies were found buried in Chad Daybell's eastern Idaho yard in summer of 2020. Chad Daybell is also charged with insurance fraud in connection with Tammy Daybell's death and two counts of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft by deception in the children's death. If convicted, he could face the death penalty. Daybell has pled not guilty. Last week, his attorney, John Pryor, told KIVITV in Boise that Daybell is ready to go forward with the case and wants to tell his story. Oh dear God, don't let this man read and or write anymore. No, sir, we have read your stories and we say no, no. I don't want to hear about your loin fire. I don't want to hear about your storms. I would like to see you try to create a portal on the witness stand, but that's just because I think you'd look like you're trying to poo yourself. Uh, two days later, 7th District, uh, District Judge Stephen Boyce issued a gag order barring any of the attorneys or parties in the case from talking about it until after jury selection and opening statements. Chad Daybell and Lori Daybell were originally scheduled to stand trial together, but in 2022, Pryor asked the court to split the cases, saying the co-defendants will have a mutually antagonistic defenses. So they were going to basically blame each other, and it would be a little bit hard to try the case together. The legal term generally means a jury would have to disbelieve one defendant in order to believe another. Our version of facts of this case will greatly different, would differ greatly from what Ms. Vallow and her legal counsel are going to be presenting, Pryor told the judge, who later agreed to split the cases. The Grimm case began in the fall of 2019 after extended family members noticed Lori Vallow's two youngest kids seemingly had disappeared and prodded law enforcement to launch a search. The subsequent months-long investigation spanned several states and took several grim and unexpected turns. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell were having an affair when both of their spouses, you know, unexpectedly shoveled off this mortal, mortal coil for some reason. I don't know. It seems like when Lori wants to leave one husband... You know, when God shuts one door, he leaves. When God takes care of one husband, another one pops up. What a dingus. <laughs> I'm sure there's an ointment for that. <laughs> oh, Old Line Red, you know she is. Because she insists on having that daybell on her name. But Chad is going to get in that bus put it in reverse, go do, 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 go forward, and then back again. She's going to be a little bit heartbroken. Sal, this might be your only chance. Uh, let's see. Vallow's husband was shot to death by her brother in Arizona in July 2019, and the brother told the police it was self-defense. Now, how they got away with that explanation, I have no idea, because anyone could look at the entire situation 
and realize you don't get a double tap to the back of the head in self-defense. And of course, that's not exactly where the bullet happened, but the entire story they tried to sell in Charles, Va Charles Vallow's death was just ridiculous on its face. Tammy Daybell died in her sleep on November 2019. Oh, the untimely death was first chalked up to natural causes, but later determined to be from asphyxiation, according to an autopsy. And if I am correct in remembering, and I'll have to look at my notes from back at that time, I believe that Chad Daybell uh, did not want an autopsy of Lori when she first passed, or not Lori, didn't want Tammy Daybell to get um, an autopsy, but then they exhumed her and got an autopsy. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell married just two weeks after Tammy Daybell died. I mean, when you're in love and you've already ordered the wedding stuff prior to the, you know, the old ball and chain kick in the bucket. The couple's friends later told detectives that the pair had also held unusual religious beliefs, including that they had been reincarnated, that they were tasked with gathering people before a biblical apocalypse. Lori Vallow Daybell referred to her youngest children as zombies before they vanished in September 2019, Gibbs testified. Prosecutors said Lori and Chad Daybell espoused those doomsday-focused beliefs to justify the deaths of her kids and his wife, but it was all part of a scheme to eliminate any obstacles to their relationship and obtain money from survivors' benefits and life insurances. I know Old Line Red. He is the one of the bigger victims in this case just because he kept trying to tell people, like, Look, I am not trying to tell you, but my wife is acting all the crazy. Like, she thinks she's an angel. I mean, he did everything right. He tried to warn people that she was thinking differently. He reached out to every single person he thought could get her help. But because she was able to put on this, he, 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 I'm a girl. And, you know, just kind of beauty pageant surface charm. No one believed Charles, and it's so sad when you see those videos of him and he's just at the end of his rope, like, look, you guys, I don't know what to tell you guys any more than what I have. My wife has gone insane. So I really want justice for Charles. I, I want justice for all of them. But Charles was so absolutely tried his best. To, to help make that a safer situation and just no one was listening to him. Oh, Lord. I just saw this. But this would be my neck of the woods. At least seven wounded all under the age of 17 in mass shooting near Indianapolis Mall. Now, this looks to be the downtown mall, and we don't go downtown in the middle of the night no more. But um, highlighting again that cities in general are becoming kind of dangerous. Seven children were injured in a shooting outside a mall in downtown Indianapolis on Saturday night, police said, with most suffering non-life-threatening injuries. The victims were ages 12 to 16, police said, correcting an earlier statement that one was 17. One of the girls is 16 and the other three are 14, the police said. Two boys are 16 and one is 12, they said. A victim hospitalized in critical condition overnight was said to be stable, according to police. Now, the other function that we need to think about, and this is pretty sad, is why are these children alone by themselves later in the evening with really no parental, you know, supervision in downtown? 
I understand that, you know, people used to let their kids go all over, but we have had problems with escalating violence in the middle of downtown in the inner city or circle city for a while. Indianapolis has not been the safest place to be. So as a parent, would I let my kiddos go out by themselves to Circle City Mall at 1130 on a Saturday? No, I wouldn't. Police Chief Christopher Bailey said it during a news conference Monday that the shooting was not a sudden act of rage. It wasn't a random type thing, he said. There was an ongoing beef. They brought that beef downtown. Earlier in the day, we believe, is when that planning took place for this event to happen, he added. Indianapolis police officers were on patrol Saturday when they heard gunshots just after 11.30 p.m. and arrived on a block outside Circle Center Mall, according to the police. Officers saw half a dozen or so people with injuries. Emergency medical services took the children to hospitals, and a seventh person, also under 17, arrived at the hospital on their own, police said. The department said that more than one firearm may have been used and that detectives believe there may have been more than one shooter involved in the attack. Two children apprehended in the aftermath of the violence were arrested based on uh, police allegations of resisting law enforcement, the Indianapolis Department said in a statement Monday. I have no information to support or confirm that the two had anything to do with gunfire, said Officer Amanda... Hib, Hib Sashman. Okay, y'all are going to all be named Smith if I don't have <laughs> a spokesperson for the department. Police say they are not ready. They were not ready to identify possible suspects, but said there are leads in the case. Investigators have been viewing security footage and submitted multiple applications for search warrants. Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department's elite team of aggravated assault detectives was probing the violence, police said. Tanya Tanya Terry, the department deputy chief of operations, described the shooting as deeply concerning. Once again, we have a situation where young people are resolving conflicts with firearms and this has to stop. Well, I'm sure you just tell them to stop and people will stop. Oh, that's right. People, even children that are, you know, going to do things that are not legal because it's not legal when you're a child to carry a firearm, aren't going to listen when the cops tell them not to do that. It almost has to be a parent and cultural thing to change. But who am I? I'm just a redhead on the internet. Terry told reporters that officers have noticed a pattern of young people leaving the mall after it closes at 7 p.m., circulating in the nearby downtown area for hours. She said that if parents don't know where their 12-year-olds are at 11.30 p.m. before Easter, that should be a priority. I think everyone sees the messages in the evening at 10 o'clock. Parents, do you know where your children are? said Terry, referring to the old public service announcement, and we should ask for our parents to get involved in what their children are doing, especially at these hours of the evening. Under state and local laws, children 15 to 17 can be out until 11 p.m. on Sunday nights. Those younger than 15 are generally prohibited from being out on streets after 11 p.m., but police said they don't have the resources to enforce curfew. This was the third in three weekends, the third shooting in the th- in three weekends in Indianapolis, because of course it is. Last Sunday, five people, including an officer, were injured in a shooting in the east side of the city. The station reported an officer shot and unalived the suspect in that case. One person was unalived and five others were injured in a shooting at a bar on March 16th, according to the Indianapolis Star. 
The suspect was arrested and charged after police were able to identify the suspect using security video from inside the bar. So the thing is, we need to have parents start parenting children. I would not be very happy. This is why I live in the suburb or out in the boonies, because if even downtown Indiana is getting hella crazy to go into, I can't imagine the bigger cities. But we're going to have to sit down and having have some really tough discussions if we want to talk about, you know, what's going on, unfortunately. In happier news, or, well, more ridiculous news, <laughs> police confuse security camera cat photo for mountain lion. As you do. I don't know. This cat still looks majestic to me. <laughs> police in California shared a resident security camera photo that was initially said to be a mountain lion. Mountain lion. <laughs> <laughs> that in no way looks like a mountain lion. And you can, can kind of tell relative size based on, I don't know, this antenna here. I mean, maybe if it was a little baby mountain lion. <laughs> uh, the, San, or the South San Francisco Police Department said in a Facebook post that the photo captured a resident's ring camera depicted... Uh, a mountain lion walking along the fence. Officers conducted an area check, but were unable to locate this furry guy, and there were no additional sightings, the post said. We'd like to remind our residents to avoid mountain lions. Even at a distance, a brief glimpse could be cause for alarm. Police later edited the post, revealing that the animal in the picture was actually just a particularly large domestic cat. We were able to confirm the big cat was not a mountain lion, the police wrote. Out of abundance of caution, we wanted to share some tips on what to do if you encounter one of these guys or any wildlife in your neighborhood. We are happy to report there is no potential threat for the neighborhood. <laughs> We pet all the mountain lions. <laughs> uh, you know, someone's heart was in the right place. They were like, you know what? That looks like a mountain lion. And we, I believe this comes right off the heels of a fairly recent mountain lion attack on two brothers in California and then a group of uh, cycling grannies, and I want to say Oregon, or maybe it was Northern California. So it is possible that someone got a little Twitter pated when they saw a giant cat. As a person who likes PT cruisers, you know, taste is subjective. <laughs> In in Florida man news, a Florida golfer captures a gator with a giant turtle locked in its jaws. Never seen anything like this. Okay. How Florida, I mean, all this all this gator needs is is a mullet, I swear to God, and a Paps blue ribbon and maybe a cigarette dang dangling out of its mouth and we've got the whole new Teenage Mutant Ninja Trailer Trash Turtles ready to go with their sensei. Great old Splinter. Big old Splinter the, great, the Gator. A man was recently playing a game of golf when he encountered an alligator that had a turtle trapped in its jaws. Casey Yarborough was on the 14th hole at a golf course in Naples, Florida, when he heard something unexpected. We heard a loud sound like a firearm went off, Yarborough told Fox 35 on Monday. It wasn't until he, he approached the next hole that he learned the source of the sound. Yarborough saw, 
saw what looked like a 14-foot alligator with something large in its mouth, Fox 35 reported. The massive alligator had its jaws around a large turtle that Yarborough estimated to weigh about 50 pounds, according to the station. Yarborough said that the rattling he heard was the sound of allig the alligator's jaw cracking through the turtle's shell. No, this would be my new my new um, show. Teenage, it would be it'd be snapping turtles, and it would be teenage mutant ninja turtles, but Florida, so they'd be teenage mutant trailer, you know, turtles. And the gator would be their sensei, but he'd have a mullet, a Pabst Blue Ribbon, and a dangling, you know, mar Marlboro with no filter on it. Look, I have, I have the scenes figured out. I just need to learn how to draw. <laughs> the turtles like stay strapped or get clapped, y'all. I got my own. Uh, Yarborough was apparently stunned after witnessing this event. I've been playing golf for ne nearly 50 years and have never seen anything like this before. Sir, you have been drunker than snot on a golf cart. You're telling me you haven't seen anything this strange before? I'm going to call shenanigans on that one. You have been golfing for 50 years. That means you have at least been drunk on a golf cart 50 times. <laughs> yes. He's a snowbird. <laughs> An alligator making a meal out of a turtle is not out of the ordinary because turtles are common prey for the large reptiles to feed on, according to Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, adult alligators are known for being opportunistic feeders, according to the FWC's website, they will eat turtles, snakes, small mammals, fish, birds, and sometimes either, even smaller gators, and apparently anyone near the shoreline. Do not go to the shoreline. <laughs> I, I hope so. I hope the turtle got away. Uh, let's see. A woman in Florida recently captured several images of a large alligator devouring a smaller version of itself. She said the moment left her creeped out, but she went on with her run, being sure to warn others about the gator that was lurking around the bend. Uh, the FWC has a variety of safety tools and tips on its website for those that find themselves in the presence of a nuisance gator. Gators less than four feet in length are not large enough to be dangerous to people or pets unless handled. Good Lord, you should never handle an alligator, even a small one, because alligator bites can result in serious infections and it's illegal. It also says if there's an alligator under four feet in your swimming pool, on your porch, or in a similar situation, call the nuisance alligator hotline. I guess we'll never know if the turtle got away. In my head canon which you can take as mostly true, the turtle got away and he learned a valuable lesson about staying away from gators that day. I'm just saying. <laughs> Good night, nurse. There's always a gator story. Always a gator. But that is the nightly news for you guys. And then I did show you the shadow box. So I'm so excited about that because until I get my giant, huge, enormous, uh, you know, entire wall cork board, I can keep all the tags together and kind of keep just a memory of all the support you guys give. And that'll be great. And tomorrow I have got everything in. I do believe I have to double check and then super glue some things together because, you know, no character would be complete without some super glue, duct tape and prayer as always. <laughs> but Judge Mo is about, is just about ready to go. Just about. So 
I have a couple of moms and dads that need all of the snark and pettiness. So we are nearly ready to go with that one. And let's see, anything else? I think that is all. I will be sending you over to Shizzy. I will be doing a quick walk around the house and make sure all the lights are off. And then I will be joining Shizzy for a little bit. So I will see you guys right over there. Have a great evening. You know, say something nice to yourself and say something nice to someone else. If you happen to just, you know, run into people <laughs> anywhere, if you have to go out to Walmart. But I try to end on that most of the time. Have a wonderful rest of your evening if you're just going to go to bed, and I will see you bright and early in the morning. Let's hope that the news is pretty good. I can deal with pretty good news. So have a great evening, you guys, and I will see you in just a couple minutes. Bye.